Miss Cubbage and the Dragon of Romance by Lord Dunsany. Recorded for Dreams, Collection 1, Stories and Poems by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in January 2020. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Miss Cubbage and the Dragon of Romance by Lord Dunsany. This tale is told in the balconies of Belgrave Square and among the towers of Pont Street. Men sing it at evening in the Brompton Road. Little, upon her eighteenth birthday, thought Miss Cubbage of number 12A Prince of Wales Square, that before another year had gone its way she would lose sight of that unshapely oblong that was so long her home and had you told her further that within that year all trace of that so-called square and of the day when her father was elected by a thumping majority to share in the guidance of the destinies of the empire should utterly fade from her memory she would merely have said in that affected voice of hers go on there was nothing about it in the daily press. The policy of her father's party had no provision for it. There was no hint of it in conversation at evening parties to which Miss Cubbage went. There was nothing to warn her at all that a loathsome dragon with golden scales that rattled as he went should have come up clean out of the prime of romance and gone by night, so far as we know, through Hammersmith, and come to Ardle Mansions, and then had turned to his left, which of course brought him to Miss Cubbage's father's house. There sat Miss Cubbage at evening on her balcony, quite alone, waiting for her father to be made a baronet. She was wearing walking boots, and a hat, and a low-necked evening dress for a painter was but just now painting her portrait, and neither she nor the painter saw anything odd in the strange combination. She did not notice the roar of the dragon's golden scales, nor distinguish above the manifold lights of London the small red glare of his eyes. He suddenly lifted his head, a blaze of gold, over the balcony. He did not appear a yellow dragon then, for his glistening scales reflected the beauty that London puts upon her only at evening and night. She screamed, but to no night, nor knew what night to call upon, nor guessed where the dragon's overthrowers of far romantic days, nor what mightier game they chased, or what wars they waged, perchance they were busy even then arming for Armageddon. Out of the balcony of her father's house in Prince of Wales Square, the painted dark green balcony that grew blacker every year, the dragon lifted Miss Cubbage and spread his rattling wings, and London fell away like an old fashion. And England fell away, and the smoke of its factories, and the round material world that goes humming round the sun, vexed and pursued by time, until there appeared the eternal and ancient lands of romance, lying low by mystical seas. You had not pictured Miss Cubbage stroking the golden head of one of the dragons of song, with one hand idly, while with the other she sometimes played with pearls brought up from lonely places of the sea. They filled huge haliotis shells with pearls and laid them there beside her. They brought her emeralds, which she set to flash among the tresses of her long black hair. They brought her threaded sapphires for her cloak. All this the princess of fable did, and the elves and the gnomes of myth. And partly she still lived, and partly she was one with long ago, and with those sacred tales that nurses tell, when all their children are good, and evening has come, and the fire is burning well, and the soft pat-pat of the snowflakes on the pane is like the furtive tread of fearful things in old enchanted woods. If at first she missed those dainty novelties among which she was reared, the old sufficient song of the mystical sea singing of fairy lore at first soothed and at last consoled her. Even she forgot those advertisements of pills that are so dear to England. Even she forgot political cant and the things that one discusses and the things that one does not 
and had perforce to content herself with seeing sailing by huge golden laden galleons with treasure for madrid and the merry skull and crossbones of pirateers and the tiny nautilus setting out to sea and ships of heroes trafficking in romance or of princes seeking for enchanted isles it was not by chains that the dragon kept her there but by one of the spells of old to one to whom the facilities of the daily press had for so long been accorded spells would have paled you would have said and galleons after a time and all things out of date after a time but whether the centuries passed her or whether the years or whether no time at all she did not know if anything indicated the passing of time, it was the rhythm of elephant horns blowing upon the heights. If the centuries went by her, the spell that bound her gave her also perennial youth, and kept alight forever the lantern by her side, and saved from decay the marble palace facing the mystical sea. And if no time went by her at all, her single moment on those marvellous coasts was turned as it were to a crystal reflecting a thousand scenes if it was all a dream it was a dream that knew no morning and no fading away the tide roamed on and whispered of mastery and of myth while near that captive lady asleep in his marble tank the golden dragon dreamed and a little way out from the coast all that the dragon dreamed showed faintly in the mist that lay over the sea he never dreamed of any rescuing night so long as he dreamed it was twilight but when he came up nimbly out of his tank night fell and starlight glistened on the dripping golden scales there he and his captive either defeated time or never encountered him at all while in the world we know rage ronces valiers are battles yet to be i know not to what part of the shore of romance he bore her perhaps she became one of those princesses of whom fable loves to tell but let it suffice that there she lived by the sea and kings ruled and demons ruled and kings came again and many cities returned to their native dust and still she abided there and still her marble palace passed not away nor the power that there was in the dragon's spell and only once did there ever come to her a message from the world that of old she knew it came in a pearly ship across the mystical sea it was from an old school friend that she had had in putney merely a note no more in a little neat round hand it said it is not proper for you to be there alone End of Miss Cubbage and the Dragon of Romance by Lord Dunsany